studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Mikhail Gorbachev, the former head of the Soviet Union, is considered by many historians to be one of the great political leaders of the second half of the 20th century. He helped shape history in ending the Cold War and changing the Soviet Union. His reforms of Perestroika and Glasnost ushered in the end of communism, as it was known, and the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. His unique relationship with former President Ronald Reagan was fascinating. They met in Reykjavik, Iceland, to talk about ending the nuclear arms race between the two countries. Gorbachev was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990 and continues to be highly respected on the world stage. But he is not as popular in Russia, where he is still criticized for diminishing the superpower status of that country. Gorbachev, however, openly blamed former President Boris Yeltsin, who succeeded him. He has now rebuilt his ties with the Kremlin under President Putin, who he praises for stabilizing the country and strengthening its global role. Today, he spends most of his time on passions, which are his charity work as an environmental foundation, Green Cross International. I spoke with him yesterday at the Palace Hotel in New York, and here is that conversation. I want to talk about history, anniversary of Gosnos, anniversary of Reykjavik. I want to talk about the present, Russia and the United States, and the future, your concern about the planet, global warming. Let me begin with Russia today uh, and the killing of Anna Plotkaya. What does that say about Russia today? Well, it says that uh, Russia is in uh, transition. It's um, in the process of very difficult democratic transition because of our difficult history, because it's always a very difficult period. And uh, it's good that the time of Yeltsin is over because he made such a mess. He broke down the country's economy. Uh, the wealth the, of the country was plundered. The state was disintegrating the economy, the army, and uh, it was an extremely difficult situation. In that sense, what Putin did, I think, has already uh, made him a place in history. That was uh, what he did in his first term. We need stability, and uh, stability requires uh, the government's great attention. But now we need to move our policy further for the modernization of our country in all areas. In this regard, I would say that the death of Politkovskaya and, uh, unfortunately, the killings of other reporters, more than 10 reporters um, have died um, uh, on Putin's watch. Uh, this is a blow. This is a blow uh, not only uh, to this wonderful woman, the mother of two children. Your friend. A wonderful Iana Vazdruk. Yes, indeed. And she is from my newspaper. Yes. Yes. I am one of the shareholders uh, in that newspaper. It's a very independent newspaper, a serious newspaper. So she was a very principled journalist, but it's a blow uh, in the back to all of us. It was a very very carefully thought through uh, murder. It, they did that on the president's birthday, and I think we should. this should be very thoroughly investigated. It's not something that is uh, just a settling of scores with Anna alone. It's more complicated. It's very serious. And therefore, all of us in the, in the newspaper and certainly the public opinion and President Putin, too, has joined in the demand for a thorough investigation to be headed by the prosecutor general to find those people. I am emphasizing this, and my colleagues in the newspaper put the question this way, because, unfortunately, there have been similar cases when journalists and uh, others and businessmen were killed and no one was found. Right. So it looks like some group is at work which uh, is conspiring in a very professional way to do those things. Has the state done enough? Has the Kremlin done enough to make sure that lawlessness does not prevail? 
Well, the Kremlin, of course, is not an investigative body. The Kremlin, of course, takes a public stand. It um, makes demands, and on many important cases, the president uh, took a very uh, serious stand. But unfortunately, many of those uh, uh, cases, many of such murders, have not been solved. It is true. He has to of course, create conditions, and our society and the uh, democratic institutions, our society, law enforcement bodies have to do a lot of work. We have to do a great deal yet in order to make our country not only stable but safe for everyone. And uh, this is important. But we are moving down that path. I cannot say that we have reversed course. That would not be true. There have been reverses and setbacks. I have said that on a number of occasions. Nevertheless, the president's attitude is that he wants to complete his second term with positive results. He is now moving more decisively to attack corruption, to assure economic growth, uh, technology, education, all of those important areas that are the main segments affecting people's lives and our society. It is said by some that this is, it sends a signal that if you speak about many things in Russia, your life is at risk. There is no freedom of expression if journalists can be killed as they have been. Well, I read the newspapers, and uh, not only in our newspaper, but in many others, Commerçant, Izvestia, Nezabissima Gazeta, uh, Vedemosti, and many other newspapers, they write all kinds of things. They're very tough newspapers. They put questions in a very critical way, and therefore I disagree that there is no freedom of speech. But on the other hand, I certainly cannot agree that we have, so to say, God in our hands. Uh, a lot remains to be done, and uh, we can only do that if improve the situation, if we improve democracy and glasnost, what Perestroika wanted to achieve. We have to continue down that path. Tell me what you think President Putin wants to see Russia do in the world. What role, because oil has given Russia economic power. Uh, the president seems to want to play a role on major issues, Iran. South Korea today invited Russia to play a role on North Korea. Russia is back as an international player. Well, our friends and partners in the United States, and we have many friends here, I think they made a mistake as regards Russia. When uh, the Union broke up, they felt that Russia was a junior kid brother who could be patted on the back. And I said to Clinton, uh, the Russians don't like it. They don't like to be patted on, on the back. Russia today is down, but it will rise. That is its history. It always rises. With oil, we had all kinds of uh, situations. On the second year of perestroika in 1986, oil prices declined to $20 a barrel. Can you imagine in what kind of situation we, the reformers, were? And nevertheless, we decided to continue along our course. It was difficult. It was a big problem for us. During all those years of perestroika, oil was very cheap, and we were losing a lot of money. Now he is lucky, just like Brezhnev was lucky. Those two people were lucky. And uh, I think uh, Putin is using this luck in a reasonable way. I don't think that there will be any kind of threat coming from Russia. Russia will speak with a firmer voice. It will speak more definitely, but it will be a serious and reliable partner. And I think this will be good for the United States. The United States need uh, serious partners. When the United States believes uh, that everyone uh, just has to follow what the United States, where the United States leads, it is not partnership. It is uh, uh, relations of uh, king and vassal. And uh, without uh, dialogue, without exchange uh, to find a common position and unite efforts, uh, no good can come of it. After September 11th, it uh, seemed to me that the president uh, was among the first uh, 
certainly in our country, who took a very definite stand. He said what happened to the United States affects us. He called. He was the first to call President Bush, and he proposed cooperation on the fighting terrorism, on the fighting the infrastructure of terrorism in Afghanistan. It was not just rhetoric. It was important work. It was a, a real battle, and uh, uh, Russia and its friends offered its military capabilities in order to work with the United States. So I think that Russia is certainly not a threat. We never wanted to fight the United States. I know that. I can say that. And we don't intend to. That should be the assumption. As for the rest of it, let's reach agreements. You have said today the United States today is more interested in cooperation with Russia, not humiliation today. I think, yes, this is happening. And not only in, uh, with uh, Russia, I think also in Europe. Uh, I remember when they called uh, Germany and uh, France old Europe, uh, tattered Europe, and there is new Europe with better blood. That was, to say the least, an incautious statement. Any attempt to act unilaterally, bypassing the Security Council without uh, uh, taking the advice of allies and partners. That's a bad thing, and that ended badly. One-sided action, lateral action, does not produce result. Even after Yugoslavia, they had to return to the Security Council and reach agreements and try to correct the situation together. The same happened as regards Iraq. So let us not continue testing. Let us uh, work together in this global world in which uh, security, the environmental crisis, uh, or poverty cannot be addressed alone or solved alone by any country, including the U.S. That's how it is. Let's uh, find solutions through dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. President Putin has said the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. And that is true. I was very much against the breakup of the Union. We needed to reform the Union, to decentralize the Union. The republics constitutionally were called sovereign states. And every constitution, even Stalin's constitution, Brezhnev's constitution, emphasized that they were states, that they have a right to self-determination and even secession. Those states had formed their political and cultural elite, their business elite, uh, the, their economies uh, were strong enough. And nevertheless, they had to go to Moscow for any of the issues to be solved and addressed. We needed to decentralize, therefore. But when we, the reformers, came to power, we started doing that, and we prepared a treaty between the republics that would have done that, would have decentralized the country. It was a difficult process. We set the date for signing that treaty on August the 20th, 1991, and the coup plotters saw that that would seal their fate, and Khrushchev, the head of that coup plotters group, uh, the KGB chairman. He said, uh, well, if we act later, it will be too late. We need to act before the signing of the treaty. He hoped to get support, but they uh, did not get support. They failed, inevitably. So the union needed to be reformed rather than broken up. It was not inevitable that the union had to break down. Five years after uh, the collapse, um, people were asked on television, the coup plotters and those who signed the agreement to break up the union, they were asked, oh, Yeltsin's project has failed, uh, has made things more difficult. What should have been done? And Bourboulis, Yeltsin's right hand, he said, well, what we needed to do is to create a soft union, a softer union. Gorbachev right. Right. Union. So first they broke it up, first uh, they broke all the structures that existed and uh, caused great hardships for the people. Even today in Russia almost half the population are poor. We have the resources, we have educated people. 50% of the people. Russians today are living in poverty. 50%. Yes, indeed. One out of every two in poverty. Yes. Back, back to Mr. Yeltsin. You have called him a traitor. No, давай. Well, let's not go back to him for a long time because I don't like to talk to him.
You, you haven't spoken to him in 15 years. No, not in 15 years. More than 15 years. 16 years, almost. You, you, you believe that Mr. Yeltsin went by, lied to you when he, when he dissolved the union, and that that was, in your judgment, an act of treachery, an act of made him a traitor. Yes, indeed. It uh, was not just lies, it was political betrayal. Political betrayal because he, together with me, after the coup, participated in the work to draft a new union treaty that would take account of the lessons of the coup. Right. At that same time, he was preparing a coup, his own coup. And he did that coup in Belovezhska Pusha. So he is not a reliable person. We had agreements with him on many issues. Why didn't you send him away, make him an ambassador to pick your country? I regret that. I regret that very much, yes. I very much regret that I didn't send him away. But I was thinking that, well, for the first time, Perestroika allows us to address problems democratically through democratic procedures, that vengeance has no place, that um, we should not have political massacres. Uh, so, of course, Yeltsin had to step down from one position, but he was still a member of the Central Committee. He had the rank of minister. We wanted him to participate. This is what we thought and this is what we did. But Yeltsin thought and acted differently. And as soon as he had a chance, he took that chance and used it fully. And uh, he also was thinking that they will be actually carrying him in his arms and praising him for breaking down the Union in the West, in the West, that they would be that he, he thought that he would get adulation and also dollars uh, from the West for that. But it was an illusion and uh, poor thinking. It is said now, after Ukraine, Georgia, they've had demand for freedom, some people believe that those regions are moving back towards Russia. Do you believe that? Ukraine, Georgia, Kazakhstan. Well, I think we, first of all, need uh, understanding between the Russia and the United States. Uh, the United States has interests uh, there because the former Soviet Union is located closely to important centers of world power, to important conflicts, to oil countries where the energy problem is being solved. And therefore, the U.S. has an interest to be present in those former Soviet countries. But that should not result in a situation where Russia would lose all its impact in that uh, region, because there are many ethnic Russians there. In Ukraine, there are at least 14 million uh, Russians. Uh, you can uh, create several states from uh, those people. So we should understand each other and we should cooperate in that space. When they say that, well, in Georgia they now have a new government, it's a democratic government, I smile on that. If that is democracy, or George Bush uh, in Moscow, at one of the meetings in Moscow, uh, said to Putin, you should create a democracy in your, countries, in your country as in Iraq. And we were surprised, and the president was surprised, and President Putin said, certainly Iraq should not be our example of democracy. So we should understand that democracy is a serious business. It should be homegrown. It should, of course, take account of the experience of other countries and of the common principles, but it should be based on the mindset and culture of a particular nation. Is it acceptable that North Korea have nuclear weapons? Or does something, either diplomatically or militarily, have to be done? And should the United States, Russia, and China together do it? Well, speaking of the role and responsibility of the United States, uh, definitely it's there. It's the only superpower and uh, it bears a lot of responsibility. But it should use this role, this power and position in a way 
that uh, is not based on command pressure and domination, it, I think, is now very clear that in 10 years this has not worked. So what is needed is partnership. And there is nothing wrong about partnership, nothing wrong about patience with your friends and allies. What's so bad about that? We should be like this. We should find solutions in this way. As for Korea, I think that uh, the six-party framework, uh, the members of the six-party framework could play a very important role. There is the uh, six-party statement uh, of September 2005. It's a very important statement. And now there is also the resolution, uh, the Security Council resolution. So those are the two documents that I think oblige uh, now us to resume consultations within the six-party framework. And um, then the five members of the six-party framework has to reach, have to reach agreements that would guarantee Korea's security and at the same time call for certain measures of humanitarian support because the situation in that country is very difficult very tough. So what I suggest is that they should reach a common position and then uh, should put that position to North Korea and negotiate with North Korea on a common stand. Let us not drive them into a corner. When you drive a wolf into a corner and when all of those dogs and hunters are there, the wolf is ready to do anything. Let's not bring it to that point. We are dealing there also with the people, millions of people. They're not bad people after all. So uh, I think that now a very important step has been taken in the right direction. Let us not, at the let us not waste this moment. At the UN. Shag, да? Вон важный шаг. Где важный шаг yeah. был сделан? Вон. At the United Nations. Шаг был за в организации Объединенных Наций. Но северокорейцы on хотят вести переговоры один на один только с США. I think that if there is a common position, if there is a common proposal adopted uh, by the other members of the six-party framework that would guarantee security and uh, also help in economic problems in North Korea, it would be a common position and uh, the United States uh, uh, could uh, meet with North Korea in some place based on that common position. The United States could bring that position to Korea. I think we shouldn't avoid that kind of talk. Uh, the Americans would be expressing the common position developed by in the six-party framework. And that common position ought to be what? First of all, it should contain assurances of security for North Korea. We should state very clearly, uh, look at all of those members of the six-party framework, China, right. the United States, right. Russia, Japan, right. North, uh, South Korea. What else do we need? These countries can achieve everything they want. They should show patience, a constructive approach, not show anger. This is politics. It requires a lot of restraint. And uh, I believe that uh, if in this uh, document, based on uh, the uh, September 2005 statement, uh, we have uh, this new document in combination with Resolution 1718, we will have a basis for uh, reaching agreement with the North Korean government. We can put that position to them. And they will give up nuclear weapons? Well. If all of those issues are addressed and solved, I believe that common sense will ultimately triumph, and they could, they could do it. They could renounce nuclear weapons because they have nowhere to go. When I'm speaking about the five members of the Sixth Party, I, am, I also remember that there is the sixth member, and that is North Korea. Of course, we need to impress on them that this is the situation. It's a big question overall because Many leaders of uh, countries uh, are looking at the members of the nuclear club. Why are those members putting pressure on other countries not to proliferate, not to spread weapons? There are 31 countries that are threshold countries that could develop nuclear weapons. India, Pakistan, North Korea, Israel have nuclear weapons, etc. I frankly don't know whether I've listed all of those um, new members of the nuclear club, but the process of reducing and eliminating nuclear weapons, the process of ending nuclear testing, 
of ending the improvement of nuclear weapons and developing new types of nuclear weapons, that uh, process of arms reduction has slowed down. I believe that we need to put an end to this situation. Members of the nuclear club should now act and obviously other countries are watching. Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty obliges the members of the nuclear club to show an example of reducing nuclear weapons if they require that others should renounce those weapons, then a, uh, they should reduce the reliance, the dependence on, of, of the world on nuclear weapons, on the weapons that they have. If we want to have weapons and uh, don't allow others to have those weapons, then uh, those others ask, what is the agenda? What do they want? Do they want to have the absolute weapons in order to give orders to the rest of the world? Is this democratic? Is this consistent with the UN spirit? No. So this is uh, an important, another way of putting this issue. I have participated in a number of conferences and uh, in the Pugwash conferences. We held um, uh, recently a, a conference at the UN with Ted Turner in order to emphasize those issues. You cannot demand that others do something and at the same time not show example. Okay, but with respect to Iran, the same principles apply. The principles are the same, I think, but there are many nuances and uh, we have to bear in mind uh, the uniqueness of that country. When we speak, when we say that nations that are involved in the dialogue with Iran, the European Union, the United States, uh, Russia, China, well, the demand uh, should be this. First of all, Iran must act within the spirit and in the interest of all the world community. But have they so far? Have they so far? Well, I think Iran, Iran is playing. And uh, this is not the kind of situation in which one should uh, do play too much. You should not abuse the patience of uh, the other side uh, and its uh, willingness for dialogue. So I think Iran should understand that this is the position. Nevertheless, again, we should continue dialogue. Okay. I don't know why uh, two American aircraft carriers are now moving in the direction of Iran. I don't know why this is happening. Are you familiar with that information? No. Let me ask you this about the Soviet Union when you were leader. Twenty years ago you went to Reykjavik with Ronald Reagan. You came that close, that close to an agreement to abolish nuclear weapons. Well, let me tell you, we came close to the signing of an agreement that would uh, call for a step-by-step -step right. elimination of nuclear weapons. And as I said, and President Reagan both said, fortunately he said that too, we wanted ultimately the elimination of nuclear we weapons. Of all nuclear weapons. Yeah, uh, Schultz yes. was very surprised when we agreed on that. Uh, Schultz was the Secretary of State. Mr. Reagan, Ronald Reagan, my partner and friend, was a great president. He had, uh, at that moment, when uh, it seemed that uh, something might happen even without the will of political leaders and a nuclear conflict might erupt, he was able to overcome the stereotypes and he met us halfway. So we proposed first a 50 percent reduction and then continued reductions and we reached an agreement on that. The SDI was the obstacle, but it was only the obstacle in Reykjavik. But then uh, next spring we started um, uh, negotiations uh, on INF and by the end of the year we agreed on uh, the elimination of INF missiles and uh, we developed uh, an amazing treaty that included verification, verification of uh, the reduction. Today 
This is what we have in, at our disposal. We don't need new verification systems. That's very important. And when uh, George Bush and Vladimir Putin met and discussed the problems of uh, um, ABM and uh, strategic nuclear weapons, they still reaffirmed that um, uh, verification mechanisms uh, already exist. We don't need new verification mechanisms. But then the United States uh, made a strange proposal. It, it looked very strange to me. I, I've not yet mentioned this. Uh, they said, well, we now have the framework treaty, framework agreement. But as for uh, exchanges of verification teams, we don't need that. Every country should be responsible for verifying uh, nationally. Then at some point it became clear that Russia too is working on some new weapons, uh, just like the United States of America, that proclaimed that nuclear weapons uh, can be used in uh, a nuclear strike, even in the first strike, and in the new doctrine, even in a preemptive strike. Russia too rejected uh, the uh, commitments that we made during Perestroika. Russia, too, um, allows for the use of nuclear weapons. I believe that Americans provided... Europe, today. There was a time under Putin that it appeared Russia was moving towards Europe. The impression today is Russia's moving away from Europe. No. Putin is a European. He is a committed European. We all believe that we are Europeans, with few exceptions. Of course, just like uh, in your uh, country, we have all kinds of troubadours. But the overall attitude uh, among the people uh, the sentiment of the people is pro-European. Putin, as our president, is also pro-European. We believe that uh, we are helping the Europeans to address their energy problems, and therefore we hope that now that Russia is modernizing its economy and all other areas, uh, trying to introduce all of the new information technologies, etc., that Europe will participate in that process. And Europe is beginning to participate in that process of modernization of Russia. They are getting tremendous energy resources from Russia, but until recently they did not want to be involved in our projects to improve and modernize our our industry, and that was very strange. They were thinking perhaps that we were stupid. Uh, we don't think that we are stupid. I think that we are smarter than others, than many others. Well, maybe I'm going too far. Anyway. Oh, what others? Uh, and nevertheless, I think that right now, Something is emerging, a common project of uh, ramping up cooperation in uh, the energy area for the benefit of Europe, but at the same time in modernizing Russia's economy for the benefit of Russia. And I believe that this is very important. But just imagine the map, look at the map. Europe and Asia. Russia begins in Europe and uh, ends near Alaska. Right. In Vladivostok. Right. Nine and a half time zones. It's incredible. So, what should be our attitude toward uh, our neighbors? Everyone, everyone says that we should live well with our neighbors in the cities and in the villages. India is our neighbor, Iran is our neighbor, China is our neighbor, Kazakhstan is our neighbor, Japan is our neighbor. So I believe that it is good that uh, being a European country, Russia is at the same time 
continuing to develop and improve relations with those countries too. I think this is very much for the benefit of everyone. I think that we should definitely look at China and consider its role. We want China to be an organic part of uh, international relations. For that, we need to cooperate with them. We should cooperate them, you should cooperate yeah. with them, and we should not well, play the China card. No one should play the China card. Do you think the United States is trying to play the China card? The, the idea is that China is being very aggressive because it needs oil. Russia has oil. That should... Well, I don't think that we should call uh, China an aggressor. I think uh, that that would be going too far. I say that China is uh, an active uh, player. It is uh, certainly intensifying its potential, expanding its uh, capabilities, but certainly uh, the Chinese have many problems. They have 180 million unemployed, almost the entire population of the U.S. There's a, a lot of poverty there. They have to address many problems. They're interested in cooperation. Look how actively they cooperate with the United States. There is so much interdependence between China and the U.S that um, before doing anything and deciding anything that affects the interest, there has to be a, a very careful balancing. And I think this is good. Between our two countries, it's not as good because for all practical purposes, we do not have an economic relationship. With between the United States and Russia. Yes. But uh, look at the mutual interest. I recently had a meeting with uh, uh, the president of Boeing who came to Moscow. In uh, Moscow, Boeing has uh, um, uh, a big, in Moscow, Boeing has uh, a lot of cooperation. Uh, they have people working for them in Moscow, computer programmers and others. So there is cooperation. And when some uh, supplies and deliveries uh, uh, were uh, prohibited uh, from the U.S. to the Sukhoi Corporation, Boeing was concerned too, because uh, that could mean the end of cooperation. President Putin, in nationalizing oil, has canceled contracts with American oil companies. Well, that's the settling of relations, I would say. Uh, the fact that um, oil has been nationalized is not quite true. Uh, the uh, oil companies now have a big uh, stake of the state, but it also they also have a private stake. And uh, certainly oil is a very important resource for Russia and it needs to be managed responsibly. Or has uh, Russia let anyone down in terms of supplying energy resources? No, it hasn't. For us it's very important, <laughs> very important for our consumers to consume those resources. We cannot do without that, we cannot dump oil in the ocean. With respect to history, some argue that if you had followed the Chinese model of economic reform first, political reform later, as the Chinese did, it would have been better for Russia and the world. No, well, what I say to this is the following. In China, we should do things the Chinese way, in Russia, the Russian way, in India, reforms should be Indian reforms. In each country, reforms should be adjusted to the needs of that particular country. Initially, we believed that we needed to improve the existing system. We thought that the system could be made to work. We wanted not only through glasnost, we wanted uh, socialism with a human face. We also took a number of decisions to develop technologies, uh, technological progress to improve efficiency and productivity, etc., etc. But all of that was um, being stalled by the bureaucracies and by the institutions of the old system. And therefore, we could not move without move forward without changing the political structure. We needed to give 
to give possibilities for developing the capabilities of a market economy, for developing the potential of a market economy. In a market economy, well, we got your help in this way. Uh, you and the International Monetary Fund uh, imposed on Russia the Harvard model of economic yeah. reform, and we were in a corner. We were in a corner, and now we have rejected that. But, but we need time to stand on our feet firmly in market economics, in democracy, in all other areas. We are now clear in which way, where we should go. There are two wings now that are debating in Russia. One is a kind of more social democratic uh, part, and uh, the others are the neoliberals. The, American, the Americans like liberal economics. Well, uh, if you like that kind of philosophy, that is your philosophy, we don't mind. But even under the Washington consensus, when President Clinton was president, he still used the government in order to improve education and the technological innovation. So America found it quite possible to have government intervention for these purposes, but Russia should not have government intervention. Well, no one can prohibit that to us. We now understand how we uh, should develop our economy. We ha now have the entrepreneurial class that is working well in the market economy. We'll continue to go down that path. Was China right to change economics first and politics later, rather than your idea to change politics first and economics later? We started with the economy. If you may remember our first idea was, and this idea, based on that idea, we took some very important decisions, was acceleration, to accelerate our development. And uh, technological progress, cooperatives, uh, giving autonomy to the factories, uh, we wanted to change things. But the nomenclatura, the bureaucracy, didn't want that, didn't want that change. And that's why we, we had to turn around and to do things in order to involve the people in uh, uh, the process in changing to market economics. You said that in China uh, the economic project came first and then thinking about politics. As for democracy and democratization, as for political changes, China is only coming close to that need. I don't know when and how they will do it. I would recommend that they do it in a Chinese way, making sure that China remains stable, because that will be a difficult test. It's very serious. And China, by the way, for 10 years, did not publish uh, any of my books, even Zhang Ziming, my friend, under Zhang Ziming, they did not publish any of my books. It was only over the past three years that they have published all of my books in China. And uh, uh, I am, I've published a new book in uh, uh, Russia. They are already publishing that book in China too. So I think that they're doing this because they're coming close to the moment when they need to think about how they will move toward democracy and political reforms. They are studying what uh, worked well under Gorbachev and what failed under Gorbachev. They are reading what I wrote and they are thinking, and I think that's a good thing. But it's their responsibility, it's up to them to conduct their reforms, no one else. When you look at your life, what is it the achievement you are proudest of? Well, I'm proud that I'm still alive. <laughs> I went through the kind of tests in my life that uh, I can stand all that because I have the faith that, that I, uh, all that I did is very necessary and this is, was and is very inspiring to me. I also think that I got good genes from my parents and my nervous system is still in good shape, and that's important. And of course, I was lucky uh, that I had a good wife and my family. Today, I'm without Raisa, but our family is a very, very close family. 
in which there is a lot of respect and love and support. And uh, this was the basis mm, that, that Raisa laid down in our family. As for pride, well, we were able to move our country toward democracy. We were able during the years of perestroika to end the totalitarian system and start moving toward democracy, glasnost, political, economic, religious pluralism. We opened the country to other countries. We allowed people to freely leave the country if they wanted to. This was quite an achievement. And when people today are kind of grading perestroika, uh, perestroika, well, was a very brief period in history. It was very turbulent. It was like lava from a volcano that was very difficult to manage. And I'm very proud that despite the fact that perestroika was broken off, was interrupted in 1991 because of the domestic uh, uh, reasons, we had been able to move the country to a point of no return. There will be no return to the past. There will be some setbacks. There have been setbacks. And uh, among countries that started democratic changes at the end of the 20th century, the UN says that in more than 100 countries there have been setbacks to democracy. Why is that? Well, because in many cases democracy hasn't been able to address and solve the social problems, the problems of poverty. And people are concerned, and when those problems are not addressed, some people say we would be ready to accept an authoritarian system, but we need stability, security, and safety, etc., etc. I don't think that strategically that is right. I think strategically that is wrong. But on the other hand, when Putin inherited chaos, he could not act uh, by the book, by the democratic book. He needed to do something strong in order to stop the process of disintegration. He did that. He didn't act by the democratic book sometimes, but now he is more and more emphasizing the democratic process, and I believe that the world is changing. I have said uh, to Americans on my trips here uh, last year and this year, I've said to them, you want us to have a democracy just like yours. We want a democracy too, although we have some criticisms of your democracy, we accept that America is a country of democratic institutions. But I said to them, you think that we are so talented that we are capable of doing in 200 days what you achieved in 200 years. We need time. We need time, historic time. And so that's why I'm saying today that we must be amazed uh, not at what we haven't yet achieved in the democratic process. So the achievement was perestroika. What was the mistake that you made? Well, the main mistakes, there were three mistakes, main mistakes. There were a lot of smaller mistakes. The big mistake was that we acted too late to reform the party. The party became the big break on perestroika. It stalled perestroika. And uh, around the party, the opponents of perestroika began to unite. The coup, the coup was a putsch, an attempted coup that was led by members of the leadership who were close to me. I was bringing them in almost forcibly to work with me on perestroika and then they turned against me. So we should have reformed the party, and that was the big mistake and the most important mistake because the party was decisive in this process. And uh, when uh, the whole thing broke, we should have uh, introduced a real multi-party system sooner. Then we acted too late to reform the union. We thought that that could wait. Uh, we should have reformed the union. The people wanted it. The referendum showed that people wanted a, the union to be preserved, but in a reformed way. So we started doing that, but too late. And uh, that uh, caused a clash. And uh, there were domestic complications, and the coup plotters wanted uh, the Union Treaty not to be signed, and in that way they undermined the reform of the Union. And uh, another thing that was of some importance, people believed in perestroika, people believed in Gorbachev and supported him, but then in 1990 they began to have doubts. 
they began to say, well, something is not going right for Gorbachev. He's not doing something right. And Yeltsin at that time was uh, uh, proposing his oppositionist ideas, and he was making promises. People like to hear promises. And the situation was this. The whole country was facing a very difficult crisis in the consumer market, in the consumer market, in the stores. The stores were empty, the shelves were empty, and people had the money, their wages had grown, but they uh, stood in lines, they could not spend that money. And I should have taken 15, 20 billion dollars to buy consumer goods abroad and to saturate the markets with those consumer goods. There was a debate about this in the Politburo. And uh, the secretary of the Central Committee in charge of the economy was proposing this. Nevertheless, I supported the Prime Minister Rishkov on this, and his opinion was different. And I think that was a mistake on my part to support him. And that was a big miscalculation. So those are the three big mistakes. When people stood in lines, they definitely were unhappy, and they thought, well, someone else could do better. So those are the three biggest mistakes. Your place in history rests on whether the reforms over time will prove to be successful for Russia, or whether Russia will retreat into a despotic regime. Yes, a lot hinges on that. But uh, a lot hinges also on what would be happening to the world, because to a large extent, uh, by ending the Cold War, by opening up the world, we opened opportunities for a new global world. Now, it is difficult to give final conclusions. I think that the ideas that were proposed by Perestroika were necessary, necessary for us, for the people of other countries, and therefore I have no doubts. But opportunities can be used differently. They are used differently. Up until now, we have not been able to take advantage of all of those opportunities. But, um, well, there is one consolation. Uh, once a French delegation came to Beijing and they spoke to Chou Enlai. Chou Enlai was number two to Mao Zedong. And uh, a young woman member of that French delegation asked, Mr. Premier, Premier of the State Council, that was his title. What was the impact of the French Revolution on the world and on China? And without missing a beat, Chairman Lai said, it's too soon to tell. And that was 180 years after the French Revolution. And we are still alive today. There is a distance that is needed in order to offer a definite conclusion. What I can say is what we were doing was necessary. First of all, we avoided uh, uh, a civil war in our country, avoided a nuclear war in the world. Now people should uh, see how to move on, how to move forward. Uh, history is a fickle lady. The verdict of history to Gorbachev, I don't know what it will be, but I can only repeat the words uh, of Willy Brandt, we tried, I tried. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.